Okay, folks, let's get started. It is Friday. It is beautiful out there. I noticed the slides are not online yet. The what? The slides. The yes, I apologize. So, two things. One thing, maybe three things, one of them being the lecture. Uh, I apologize. I meant to get slides posted for you. I didn't get slides posted. I will get them all posted. I should uh, be able to get, I think, the rest of the term posted for you. So I'll get that all, all set up. Uh, so I apologize. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. I will get that done. Second, I had expected the TAs would have the exams to me by today. I haven't gotten them back from the TAs yet, which is why you don't have them yet. Once I get those, I will, get a, I will post a key. I always wait until I get the exams available to you before I post uh, the key. So I don't have that to the exams to hand back out to you at this time. Unfortunately, they will almost certainly be there by Monday. So you can expect them on Monday. And um, the last thing is the lecture. So we'll have the lecture and uh, move forward. So I uh, hope everybody's got a big wild weekend planning. It's supposed to be 85 degrees this weekend. So, Which means you'll have all kinds of great weather for studying biochemistry. Fishing. We're going fishing. Where? Yeah. Where there's water. <laughs> Ask a stupid question and what do you get? <laughs> okay, that's okay. It's not a pop quiz, so fishing sounds like a good thing to do, though. <laughs> this is the only class. <laughs> this is the only. I guess if it doesn't quiet down, there will be no chance for that. So, whoa. <laughs> I will see how well you behave yourself today, and then we will, we will decide. How's that? For those of you who turned in exam regrades, I do have those done. If you want to come pick them up from my office sometime, I have them for you. Um, and uh, we'll move forward. Well, we've got a fair amount to do, including maybe a pop quiz. I don't know. It may depend on how well things go and how, well, how loudly you sing today and that sort of thing. Uh, in deciding. Okay. So last time I finished up by talking about blue-white screening. If I said to you to tell me why blue-white screening is useful, what would you tell me? One sentence. What's the one sentence you would say about why blue-white, what does blue-white screening tell you? Okay. You're getting there. Keep. Anybody else? That's fine. It's a, it's a good start. What's that? It tells you if you have an insert in your plasmid. Okay? That's really useful. Okay? The number one thing it tells you is if your plasmid has an insert in it, because that insert now presumably is the gene that you put into it, right? That's really, really important. Okay. Um, well, genetic engineering is, is uh, what all these things are about. We talk about recombinant DNAs, we're talking about genetic engineering. Genetic engineering meaning we're altering the genomes of something. We're altering sequences of DNA for our own purposes, okay? There are a lot of, uh, there are a zillion uses that people want to do genetic engineering to change things, okay? I can't even begin to tell you um, how many there are. Uh, but there are some very cool ones that are out there. One I like to describe is mutant mosquitoes. Okay? You think of mutant mosquitoes and you think of something as large as going out there and gobbling up the world. But in fact, one of the strategies for controlling malaria are to take and make mosquitoes that are unable to reproduce, okay? but that breed with other mosquitoes. All right? So what happens is they breed with other mosquitoes, don't produce offspring, and as a consequence stop the proliferation of uh, mosquitoes and stop the proliferation of malaria. That's one thing that we can do with genetic engineering. Okay? Transgenics are, uh, and of course transgenic, when I say the word transgenic, what I'm talking about is altering the entire genome of an organism. That's how I make a mutant mosquito that's unable to reproduce properly. Okay? 
Transgenics also have importance for food production. All right? So um, there are a lot of issues with this, and they're not a simple answer to um, the world's food problems. There are economic considerations with these. But when I make a transgenic plant, okay, I usually have some aim in mind in terms of why I'm doing this, what I'm trying to make with this transgenic plant. One of the things that people do with transgenic plants is they give plants resistance to certain herbicides that are used. Okay? So if I have a gene that is resistant to, how many people in here are gardeners? Many people use Roundup. So if I, uh, Roundup is an herbicide that is very effective at knocking out um, plants of a, of, a, of a pretty broad spectrum, okay? Um, Monsanto, for example, would like to sell you herbicide-resistant corn or herbicide-resistant uh, pepper plants or something like that. And the reason they would like to do that is because large agricultural concerns that plant these, these uh, herbicide-resistant products can then spray their fields with herbicide and the corn stays resistant, but the weeds and so forth that are there don't grow because they're not herbicide resistant. Two questions arise with that. One question being, am I now eating herbicide mm -hmm. in my food? Probably, okay? And uh, the other is, what happens if those genes jump from the organism that I intended it for into the weeds? Am I now creating a, a whole new variety of herb resistant weeds? And the answer is maybe, okay? It has happened with a few species already, yes. And as you might imagine, those are of considerable concern. Can we make more food that way? Probably. Okay. But all these are a balance. So we have to think when we think about genetic engineering, there's no um, strict uh, uh, guidelines in terms of uh, it, are, there, are the benefits better or worse than what we currently have. Okay. Uh, there are some very clever strategies that people have come up with that probably have very low impact for people. There are other strategies like herbicide-resistant uh, plants that probably have a greater impact for people. So we have to, when we weigh the uh, value of these uh, strategies, we have to think about what's coming out, that is the amount of food being produced, for example, versus the cost uh, to society, uh, specifically in the form of exposure to other things. There are some strategies that don't involve serious exposure to other things and actually are probably innocuous in the scheme of things. Okay, well, um, one of the main tools that has come available to us uh, from a biotechnology perspective in the past uh, 15 years, uh, and it has really revolutionized um, our ability to work with the genomes of organisms is the polymerase chain reaction, or as it's called, PCR. When I described to you the other day the fact that when I was a graduate student, it was literally a um, PhD thesis to isolate a human gene, and I told you I could take any one of you and tonight have you isolate a human gene, you wouldn't need any more training than that. What really made most of that possible was this phenomenal technique called the polymerase chain reaction. So, I want to say a little bit about the polymerase chain reaction going forwards um, and um, give you a little perspective on that. So polymerase chain reaction is uh, a, uh, and a pretty incredible technique. And what it does is it allows a researcher to do targeted replication of a specific region of DNA in a test tube. It does targeted replication of a specific region of DNA in a test tube. So what it really is doing is it's borrowing the cell's ability to replicate DNA and takes it out of the cell and puts it into a test tube. Well, if we think about what a cell does, what does a cell do? We've seen that a cell starts as one cell. When it divides, it's two cells. When that's, those two cells divide, they become four, they become eight, they become 16, they become 32. And so what we see is this geometric doubling of the number of cells with each round of replication. So if I go through 30 rounds of replication, at the end of that, I have 2 to the 30th 
uh, cells, okay, which means I have 2 to the 30th times more DNA than I had to start with. In 30 rounds of replication, it's possible for me to start with one copy of DNA, and at the end of that, in theory, to have well over a billion copies of DNA that I'm interested in. Well, PCR gives us, as I said, targeted replication. If I start with, let's say, a person's DNA that's left at a crime scene, okay, and I go through 30 rounds of replication of that DNA, I have a tremendous amount of DNA, but what I'm really interested in is this the person that did this or not. So I really want some targeted uh, replication because having a billion copies of a person's DNA, well, that's kind of nice and useful to think about. It really, what I really want as a quick answer is this person, the person who committed the crime or not. So typically what's done is a targeted replication that is replicating specific portions of a person's genome that is a unique identifier of that person. It's sometimes called a DNA fingerprint. So if I target the DNA fingerprint regions of a person and amplify those, I can answer the question fairly quickly, does this DNA belong to this person or not belong to this person? And because those regions of DNA are very, very specific for, a, for an individual and tell us uh, pretty definitively whether this person's DNA belongs to that or not. And these are pretty darn good, okay? They're probably, DNA fingerprints are probably more distinctive than a human fingerprint, okay? Some of the strategies of DNA fingerprinting, if you have a good batch of DNA, okay, you have the likelihood of two having the same DNA fingerprint of less than one in a hundred billion, okay? When we think about the fact that we have on the face of the earth, you know, seven billion uh, people uh, that are out there, that's a pretty good assurance that if I'm comparing it to this person and this person, I, I have a pretty good assurance whether or not when I get a particular fragment, if, it, if it's uh, in, indicative or not. Well, how does PCR, I'm, coming, I'm getting away from the, the subject, how does PCR work? PCR works by, as I said, borrowing some tools from the cell. What you see is a schematic of it on the screen. Here's a segment of DNA. It's a part of a chromosome. So it could be a part of a human chromosome, it could be part of a bacterial DNA, it could be part of any DNA, okay? All I have to have are knowledge of regions around the region I want to amplify. That is, I need to know some specific sequences before I can amplify anything. The specific sequences I need to have knowledge of, okay, are about 20 nucleotides long. So if I know a region of about 20 nucleotides on one side of the sequence I want to amplify and another region of about 20 on the other side, I can design what are called primers. And these primers are complementary to those regions. Primers, you may recall, are necessary for DNA polymerase to start replication. So the beauty of the primers is one, they provide a place for DNA polymerase to start, and B, by the fact that it starts there, it targets and tells the polymerase only replicate here. When we thought about replication of the polymerase, you remember I said that a DNA polymerase will only start where there's a primer. So if I've got you know, seven billion base pairs out there and I don't want to amplify all those seven billion base pairs, if my primers flank a sequence that's a few thousand base pairs in size, only those few thousand base pairs will get replicated. Only those few thousand. That's one of the real beauties of PCR is that targeting, okay? So I've told the polymerase this is the only place you're going to replicate things. So within the bounds of what are called these primers, that's where all replication is essentially occurring, or all effective replication is occurring. Well, again, if I start with one duplex, okay, by the end of this, I've gone through three cycles, I have eight duplexes. I have a doubling each time I'm doing that. Okay? What do I need to do PCR? Well, as I said, I need to have knowledge of the sequence so I can make these primers. And the primers I make actually are DNA, not RNA. There's no need for me to make RNA primers because that would mean I'd have to remove the primers and all that sort of stuff. I just make DNA primers. I can tell in a laboratory, I can tell a machine, synthesize this 20 nucleotide sequence of DNA. 
Okay. So I have DNA primers. That's one thing I need. I need a target DNA. It's the second thing that I need. Third thing that I need. I need, well, I need the four DNTPs. I need DATP, DTTP, DGTP, and DCTP because these are necessary to make DNA. Yeah, sure. So I need three things. I need, first of all, I need the target DNA. Second, I need the primers that are complementary to the regions around I want to amplify. Third, I need the four DNTPs, that is the DATP, the DGTP, the DTTP, and the DCTP, because that's what the polymerase is going to use. And the fourth thing I am going to need is a very special kind of DNA polymerase. Okay? The one that's most commonly used in laboratory is called TAC, T-A-Q DNA polymerase. And you don't need to know this, but T-A-Q stands for Thermus aquaticus. That's the organism that this DNA polymerase comes from. It actually was isolated from a bacterium in the uh, Old Faithful geyser in Yellowstone. Thermos tells us it's hot. Okay? Well, this is important. Okay? This bacterium lives in Old Faithful geyser. Old Faithful geyser gets rather warm. And if we think about things getting heated up, we normally think of them getting denatured, killed. right? Well, this organism has evolved to live under conditions, essentially, of boiling water, meaning that its DNA polymerase, when it gets heated up to boiling, doesn't die. It stays stable. Well, that turns out to be important in the, thir in the PCR process, because in the PCR process, we first of all have to separate the strands. To separate the strands, the easiest way to do it is by boiling. Well, the beauty of this method is I can take and mix all of these things together, and I can boil it, and I don't worry about losing my polymerase. The polymerase stays active. I boil it. That's the first step. I allow the primers to find their complements. That's called annealing. That lowers the temperature a little bit. That's the second step. The third step is that I create a temperature where the polymerase really likes to work, and I let the polymerase go do its thing, meaning it replicates. So I've got denaturation, I've got annealing, and I've got replication. That's the three steps. I go. Can you explain that annealing? Yeah. So annealing is I, there's, uh, there are special temperatures where complementary base pairs like to form. And so if I find what that temperature is, that annealing temperature, I set my reaction at that annealing temperature so that the primer can find its complementary region on the target DNA. And it does. That's necessary because if the primer is not base paired to its target region, then no replication is going to occur. So annealing is a very critical step in the process. In fact, it's the most critical step in the process of doing PCR. Well, once I've got the primer on there, then I change the temperature slightly. The polymerase now says, oh, there's a primer. I'm going to replicate this. And the primer goes and does its thing. Okay. Well, after the primer goes and does its thing, I finish one round. I'm now ready for the second round. In the second round, I'm going to do the same thing I did in the first round. I'm going to boil it, anneal it, <coughs> replicate it. Boil it, anneal it, replicate it. So every cycle consists of boiling, annealing, and replicating. 30 cycles, I have, at least in theory, a billion times more of that targeted sequence than what I started with. A billion times more. Okay. Well, that's really useful. I can take those DNAs, I can analyze those DNAs, I can work with those DNAs in the laboratory, and bang. That's something, as I said, I could literally have you do this tonight, and you would have that gene that would have been my PhD thesis in one night. That's kind of scary. Is that, a, is that a question or is that just a, I'm relaxing my hand? Was it 30 or 30? 30 cycles are typically what's done. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Where does the DNA come from? Where does the DNA come from? Well, it kind of depends on what I want to do. So it might be DNA from a crime scene. It might be human DNA. 
It might be I'm working with rats and I want to isolate this gene from rats. It could be rat DNA. It could be a DNA from any source. It really depends on what I'm trying to get. Okay? You're in enough trouble as it is. All right. So um, this technique can be used to make DNAs for all kinds of purposes. And it's been modified in many ways to do some very, very cool diagnostics not only isolating DNAs, but also determining how much of a given sample is there. Uh, it's called quantitative PCR. There's all kinds of variants on it that people have done, and uh, pretty impressive stuff. One of the places it's commonly used is for DNA fingerprinting. And with DNA fingerprinting, we're really trying to identify, again, not only um, whose DNA is this, but in some cases, who's the father or mother of a child. Okay? And these are pretty straightforward to do. Again, if we look at varying regions uh, of a um, uh, DNA and we compare the, off the, the DNA of the offspring to the offspring of the alleged parents, we can usually pretty easily determine if a person uh, at least is not the parent. Okay? Uh, and we've got about a 1 in 100 billion chance that they are the parent. Um, it's pretty that you know that the person we say is the parent is the parent that, that one, one in one billion chance that we're wrong uh, we're in pretty good shape so uh, DNA fingerprinting is really useful as they say for crime scenes it's really useful for determining parentage uh, of, chi of, of uh, children okay uh, paternity testing that's just sort of a nice uh, scheme that uh, shows that and you can see a little bit about how the child inherits obviously one copy of each chromosome from each parent and since parent, if parents have differing regions of chromosomes, we can easily figure out which ones came from which parent and if they both came from two people suspected. Uh, blah, blah, blah. What can I say? Find something for this. Oh, no. I'll pass on micro arrays. Okay? All right. That's what I want to say about biotechnology. So let's move uh, forward. And uh, we will t I want to talk about, actually, it's a related area, viruses, cancer, and immunology. But I thought before that we did that, we would sing a song. Okay? Yay. Yay. Now, maybe if everybody sings loud today, I don't know, who, something magical might happen. So um, this is an old Beatles song. It's a, a fairly new song. I've only sung it in class one time. It's to the tune of an old Beatles tune called Norwegian Wood. And nobody knows what that tune is, right? How many people know the tune Norwegian Wood? A few do. Okay. So especially those that know it, I want to hear you singing really loud, okay? It's about student nightmares, all right? I answered 3B, but then I thought it might be C. Or was the false true? I can't undo. It makes me blue. It asked me to list all the enzymes that regulate fat. <laughs> As I wrote them down, I discovered I didn't know Jack. I ought to give thanks, scoring some points, filling in blanks. I squirmed in my seat, feeling the heat, shuffling my feet. Professor then told me there wasn't a chance I would pass. So I started crying and fell through a big pane of glass. I suffered no harm, cause I awoke to my alarm. Oh, nothing compares to deadly scared of student nightmares. Do you guys have these dreams? Oh yeah. You know, I still have them myself. I still dream that there's this class I've forgotten. You know, it's late in the term, and I've forgotten. Oh, my God, I haven't gone to this class, and I'm in trouble. They don't go away, folks. Okay. Well, um, I said I want to talk about viruses and other things related to that because they do actually indirectly relate to biotechnology. Shh. All right? Viruses are pretty remarkable structures, okay? Look at that. That is an image of a virus. Vir this particular virus looks like a little, uh, I don't know, cannonball or something with projectiles sticking off of it. One of the things I find that's remarkable about viruses is that they are, first of all, nanoscopic structures. This is a protein coat that is around the nucleic acid of this virus. I don't know if this is an RNA virus or a DNA virus, but it doesn't matter. Okay, 
the nucleic acid is protected inside that coat. Now, a virus has to exist okay, out in the real world, where it's dry, where it's hot, where it's got all kinds of nasty things that are out there. The only protection the virus has for its nucleic acid is that coat. So that coat's pretty important. All right? The other thing that's kind of like cool about the viral coat is that it's an example of a self-assembling structure. Self-assembling. Okay? We think about you know, um, how at the nanoscopic level that we can make these little molecular motors or we can make you know, human-made things that are just so tiny we can't see but that they're actually doing something. Viruses actually have this. Viruses have the ability with the coat to basically assemble itself. All right? Now, the equivalent of that would be a, cross, would be a, um, a um, puzzle, you know, a 500-piece puzzle that you work on in your living room that puts itself together. The pieces literally come together. Okay? So that's pretty remarkable. That means this has to be built into the virus, and uh, that viruses actually have some very neat uh, things that they do as a, as a consequence of that. Okay? Here's some other viruses. This is actually a virus I worked on for my PhD uh, thesis, actually. It's called adenovirus. And it has a sort of, most viruses have a fairly regular structure to them um, because it's the easiest kinds of pieces to put together are those that are repeating uh, types of structures. And there's a, a, quite a variety of different forms that can happen with that. Okay. Oh, blast that. I'm really bad, aren't I? Okay. So let's go through the life cycle of a virus. It's pretty straightforward. Virus is floating out here in the air, all right? Someone has just sneezed a virus out of their lungs, right? Not too much of that going on right now, but there was a lot of that going on over the winter term, right? Someone just sneezed a virus out of their lungs. What's happened? The virus goes out. It finds a target cell. It lands on a target cell. Viruses typically will have something that will allow them to attach to that cell. Good example, flu virus, okay? Flu virus has a protein called hemagglutinin. You don't need to know that for here. All right? But what this protein does is it recognizes a specific structure on blood cells. A st specific structure. It's actually a carbohydrate structure that it recognizes on blood cells. It grabs a hold of it. So the very first step in that viral life cycle has happened. It's, it's got a hold of its target and it's, it's, it's holding on to it. Okay. The second step in the viral life cycle involves injecting the nucleic acid into the cell. That could be RNA, that could be DNA. In the case of the flu virus, I will tell you a kind of a cool story about that. The flu virus, in order to inject its RNA, flu virus is an RNA virus, in order for the flu virus to inject its RNA into the blood cell, it has to clip a little piece of sugar off. There's an enzyme that'll do that. Okay? Off of the cell. There's, little, there's a little uh, sugar residue on the surface of the cell. It has to be clipped before. In other words, it's making a hole that for entry is what it's doing in order to inject its viral uh, nucleic acid in there. Okay? One of the ways in which we target flu viruses with drugs is we inhibit the enzyme that clips that sugar off. They can't make the hole, they can't put the viral nucleic acid into the cell, and consequently the cell is protected. The virus doesn't get in, okay? Well, let's say it gets in. So when the viral RNA or DNA gets in, then what's happened is the cell has been invaded by information. That information, if it's DNA, needs to be transcribed so it can make the viral RNAs. If it's RNA, then all it needs to happen is it's either translated and or in some cases it's made back into DNA. How is RNA made back into DNA? Anybody remember? Reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase. So if it is a, a retrovirus, it will have a reverse transcriptase that will now convert its RNA into DNA. The DNA will, in the case of a retrovirus, get, get inserted into the chromosome. And there, you're stuck. Okay. Well, we haven't finished the life cycle. 
We actually haven't finished the life cycle. A nucleic acid doesn't have to get inserted into the genome. In fact, retroviruses, commonly it happens, but most viruses don't work that way. Most viruses start telling the cell to make thousands, millions of copies of the nucleic acid. Make thousands, millions of copies of the nucleic acid, and then start making the proteins for the viral growth that will self-assemble. Okay? Once that happens, the virus starts packaging all that nucleic acid that's been copied up, and essentially, it kills the cell. Because it's completely taken over the cellular machinery. All, everything that's being made in the cell is a viral protein. The cellular enzymes and so forth aren't there. They're not being made properly. And the cell is infected. The cell is, is ready to uh, basically burst open and let all these packaged viruses out to go out and infect other cells. And that's the viral life cycle. So what came first, virus or bacteria? I'm sorry? What came first, the virus or the bacteria? What came first, the virus or the bacteria? People argue about that. Very good question. Um, they, when we talk about the origins of life on the face of the earth, um, it's, uh, there are people who argue both ways. It's probably the case that the most primitive things that we would think of as life on earth were probably little packages that moved from one place to another, rather like we think of as a virus. That's my take on it for what that's worth. Um, viruses are opportunistic. Viruses, at least in their current form, need a cell in order to replicate. That's why they infect cells. Early viruses maybe may not have needed that. Okay? They may have had mo most of their own information with them. So it's hard to speculate, but people do argue about which came first, the virus or the cell. Yeah? So you're saying early on they were autonomous? Like they, they, need, they, they may well have been auton autonomous, yeah. Okay. Yep. And nobody knows. I mean, that, that's just speculation on anybody's part. But that's... The, the current thinking is that viruses probably early on were very different than what we think of as viruses today. Okay. All right. So this shows HIV. This shows the cycles in HIV that I was talking you through before. We've got this RNA into the cell. The reverse transcriptase makes DNA copies of it. The DNA copies get integrated into the host. And the host now, once it's got it in there, Every time it transcribes this region, it starts making viral RNA, which now, of course, can be packaged, go out and infect other cells. The real problem with HIV is right there. This guy is sitting there, part of the genome. It's part of the genome. How do you get rid of this thing? Okay. How do you get rid of this thing? Well, there's one strategy that's very commonly used. The very common strategy that's commonly used is you inhibit the proteins that the virus needs. You inhibit the reverse transcriptase. You inhibit the proteins that are necessary to package the virus. They're called protease inhibitors. Okay. That's two things that people do. Okay. But that doesn't get rid of the cells that are loaded with this virus. Right? So remember that retroviruses are, they, they don't have, the, the reverse transcriptase doesn't have a proofreading function. So whenever they copy something, they make mistakes, the more chances you give them to, to make mistakes, the more likely they're going to evolve a resistance to existing drugs. And that's what happens with HIV a lot. Okay? So I have my own theory about this. And my own theory is that, we're, that we can really knock down the viral load that people experience with these drugs that are there. We can actually like, give people a pretty normal life with the anti-HIV drugs that are available, okay? But we still have people that are loaded with this virus, okay? So one strategy I think we should consider for this is we should actually stimulate the cells to make HIV. Well, how's that going to do any good, okay? And what we do is we prevent the next phase, which is infection. If you stimulate cells to make HIV, but you prevent the infectious phase, then what happens is you basically selectively kill all the ones that have this. Okay? Now, is that too much of a load for the body? It may be. I don't know. Okay?
but it's a completely different strategy from the current strategy, which is to reduce this down as low as you possibly can. What if you had an absolute way of protecting healthy cells that didn't have this here? Because not every cell in a person who is infected with HIV has this in every cell of their body. Okay? That would be one strategy for uh, protecting and actually eliminating a virus uh, from, a, from a person. Okay. A related subject, and it's actually very related, it's called gene therapy. Okay. Gene therapy. Um, we think about, we hear about genetic disease, right? It's not as common as we oftentimes think about it, okay? But it is uh, an important consideration, especially if you have one, right? So, for example, if you have a genetic disease called cystic fibrosis, um, you have a life expectancy that, although it's gotten better in recent years, probably still won't stretch beyond about 35 years of age. And it happens because uh, people are deficient in a, uh, a transport protein that's important in moving ions across the cell. You guys have seen a little bit of this stuff already. People who have cystic fibrosis, as a consequence, in their lungs, the most common phenotype they have is in their lungs, they uh, get terrible accumulations of mucus. Um, and um, there's other problems in the body as well, but they get terrible accumulations of mucus, and they're very weakened um, as a result of this. And it's because they lack the uh, coding, the gene that codes for this important protein. Well, the question is, well, what, what if we could put that gene into healthy cells? You know, could we give these people a normal life uh, as a result of that? And there's a lot of strategies for doing that. There are some good news, and there's some bad news about those. The good news is we've got some cool strategies for getting things in. How do we, how do we get it? Let's imagine that I've got this, uh, this person that's got cystic fibrosis, and I know what the gene is, and I've got the, the gene from a person who doesn't have cystic fibrosis. I've got it in perfect form right here. I would like to put this gene into this person and take care of their cystic fibrosis. Can I do that? Well, how would I do that? What would I want to do? Well, the first thing I would want to do is I would want to put it into their genome, right? So whenever their cells divide, it'll still be there. They'll still be making this normal um, uh, gene, right? Well, you've just seen a way to put DNA into a cell with a retrovirus. The retrovirus is really designed very nicely to insert its DNA into a cell, right? Into a, into a, a genome, because you just saw reverse transcription. Then we get integration into the uh, chromosome, and bang. No. So what people, yeah? Retroviruses always have RNA as a genome, yeah. And they almost always integrate into the host genome. And that's probably because they have another enzyme I forgot to tell you about called integrase. Integrase allows that DNA to be integrated into the genome. Yeah? Do they slap it just anywhere, or is there a specific spot? Very good question. So uh, let, let, me, let me address that in just a second. So what people have done with this, they've taken genes and they've said, okay, well, here's all these parts of a retrovirus that we know are really nasty. You know, they're going to cause problems. Let's get rid of these things that allow it to proliferate ex excessively. But let's make it integrate this segment, segment that we want to get integrated into the genome. And so they do that. And you can actually take and you can insert a normal gene into people who have a genetic disease. And the problem is exactly what, what you said, okay, that you don't have the specificity of targeting where you want it to go. Ideally, what you would like to do is you would like to have it replace the gene that's damaged because it'll be in the exact right place in the chromosome and everything else will be set up and everything's fine and dandy. Unfortunately, the, targeting, the ability to target these things is not as good as you would like. That has given rise to some problems. Okay? So there are children, for example, who've been treated for various genetic diseases uh, that were, again, very easy to, to fix with the right gene. And some of the initial prom results that they had from these were very promising. The children, and it wasn't cystic fibrosis, but it was some other diseases that they had. Uh, they, uh, the initial results were that they were starting to live a very normal life compared to what they had with this, these various genes that they were lacking. And so there was some great excitement uh, over this. And then I think it was, uh, they had initially done about 10 kids with this. And within a couple of years, uh, uh, three of the 10 kids came down with leukemia. Yeah. And the reason is likely because 
it's inserting into random places. So in many cells, it may go into a place that's okay, it's fine, it's DNA, it doesn't cause a problem. But if we insert DNA next to, say, something, a, a gene that can cause cancer, we can alter the function of that gene, and we don't have control of where that goes. So that was almost immediately stopped as a result of the concern that arose that, you know, are you um, going to make somebody suffer as a result of the uh, treatment that you give them? Is the, is the result worse than what the disease was? And so um, those have been stopped. There are still strategies that are out there for doing um, uh, treatments, and some of them are in, uh, invented as being less invasive. Um, I'll tell you one that people have uh, thought of that's kind of interesting, I think, and that is um, imagine that uh, in the case of cystic fibrosis, that you have this person, that, as they said, the biggest manifestation of it is in the lungs. And they have you know, terrible times with mucus, coughing and hacking because the, the, this, this mucus just, just accumulates. They get infections resu resulting from it and so forth. Well, what if you were to simply alter the DNA in the lungs? Okay, you didn't want to get it everywhere. You wanted to take care of the lungs, all right? So people have engineered, taken cold viruses, okay, including adenovirus, the one I told you about earlier. They take an, an adenovirus, which infects lung tissue and so forth, uh, fairly readily and alter them so that they're less of a problem from a perspective of infection and you know basically give them an inhaler where you inhale this modified virus now that has uh, a corrected gene does it work and it does to some extent it does give some relief uh, for uh, the problems associated with that one of the problems with lungs is that with an adenovirus it's not integrating into the genome so it's only going to give a protection over the period of time that, that lung cell is alive, right? Because when the lung cell dies, then you know you, everything goes out, uh, and you engineer these things because you don't want them infecting everything out, else out there in the world, so they're not very uh, able to, to proliferate. But it's a strategy for making something fairly specific to a tissue that needs it, and um, hopefully um, helping to relieve some of the problems associated with not having the gene that that virus carries. So this, as you might imagine, is a very active area of research. People are working very uh, hard on, number one, really trying to target specifically where to put a gene. And once that problem gets solved, hopefully it does get solved, then genetic diseases and genetic modifications are going to be much more uh, prevalent because we don't worry then about, well, did this thing accidentally go in the wrong place and activate a cancer gene, for example. Clear as mud? All right, take out a piece of paper. Uh, let's see. What should we do today? Um, Give me a joke. Give me a joke. Put your name down and give me a joke and you got it. Does that have to be clean? No. <laughs> okay. Give me a joke or if you don't have a joke, what are you going to do tomorrow? And I hope they're not both a joke. <laughs> And please turn your paper into me individually. That way I know you didn't turn a paper in for somebody else that wasn't here, right? So bring your paper forward to me when you're done. Yes, sir, thank you. You're number one. Is that a joke? No. Oh, man, no joke. No joke. No joke. I give a lot of extra credit for jokes. Joke? You have a joke. <laughs> I don't think I'll tell that one. That's a cute joke. I like that. <laughs> Sorry, no joke. No joke. Oh, well. You have a joke. I've never seen before today. This is this is good. Joke. Joke. Farmers. <laughs>
Pharmacy. Pharmacy. Oh, oh man. Way over my head. Joke? No. Oh, no. Joke? No, no joke. No joke. You have a joke? We probably heard it before. You guys go by. Yes, yes. Okay. Hydrogen peroxide. Yep. Uh, yep. I've seen that one. No joke. No joke. Oh, man. Oh, well. Joke? Thank you, thank you all. Study hard. No jokes. Joke, no joke. Okay, that's fine. Joke? No, no. Studying is a joke, right? Joke, joke. All right. You're smiling. You must have a joke. Tomorrow I will drink two no, beers. That's it. Also, how many. Rio de Janeiro's does it take to change a light bulb? A br oh. Uh. <laughs> oh, 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 that's bad. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good joke. No. Nope. No. Joke? Yeah. <laughs> that's lame. <laughs> I'll cut you off on your points, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does he have a good joke? No. No? All right. Bad joke. Yeah. Put me on the spot. I can't remember. It's the only one I could come up with. Not a joke today. Oh, well, I'll have to forgive you there. Thank you, sir. I've got a couple of jokes on that. All right. Thank you. It's kind of a joke, but then I wrote what I'm doing down. But it's kind of, I don't know if it's a joke. It's you're a bus trip. I need to brainstorm some jokes. It's you, right? I had such, yeah. I had yeah. such a good science joke, and I can't think of how it goes. I remember a funny science joke, too. Mine is still microbiology. Good science joke. So, the, you know, the, the, the neutron walking into a bar, right? Oh, that, I've heard that one. Right? Neutron walks into a bar. I have heard that gets, one. Orders a beer. How much? And he says, for you, no charge. That's the one. You could have had 100 points of extra credit, but no. Oh, well. Thank you. Ah, uh, you too. Study hard, guys. Got it? All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I could tell you a joke about sodium. But nah. nah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that one. <laughs> Take care. Got it? Yes. You've got a good joke for me. Buy a bowl, send us to the Bahamas. Oh, far up. And this is. Uh, tomorrow night, actually. Tomorrow night. Uh, oh, tomorrow night I can't make it, but but thank you for the invitation. Sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care. Got a bad joke. You have a, oh, I got to see the joke. Let's see. Lame. <laughs> yeah. Take care.